Hey guys, on this week's video we're doing something a little bit different. A little while ago I started the list video, so I thought it's time to do um, a different kind of a list. So this is actually my 10 favorite little known horror films, or horror-ish kind of a film. Um, they're not in a real particular order, I think number one is my favorite of the bunch. They're kind of in my favorite uh, ranking from least favorite to most favorite, but I, but I really love all of these, so it's not so much a ranking as it is just kind of a, an order that I gave them. Um, some people have heard of these, you may not have heard of any of these, uh, but if you haven't, I hope you check them out, and if you have heard of these, I hope it's a fun little shout out to kind of a little bit more obscure side of it. So let's check out number 10. So when you talk about meta horror, most people think that it's a phenomenon that started with Scream back in 1996, but you'd be wrong. My first encounter with self-parody horror came from 1991's There's Nothing Out There, five years earlier. Released by Troma, I'm kind of partial to this one because I play horror trivia with the writer slash director. Side note, I did not know that fact until one night when we were discussing Scream and Made a Horror and I actually brought up this film and uh, he looked at me and said, um, yeah, that, that, that's my movie. So this will sound familiar. A group of friends on spring break all go to spend the weekend up in the woods in a cabin except... Name a horror film. Any horror film. I can think of about 10 right now. Mike here is a horror buff and knows the rules. He knows the tropes and tries to warn his friends, but of course, they don't listen. So this alien tentacle thing shows up and starts a killing. Everyone does the horror cliches, skinny dipping, premarital sex, and more nudity than you'd expect from such a low budget monster movie. Our creature has green laser eyes and melts people's faces, can mind control people, and it's mainly interested in eating the men and, oh, mating with the women. It's a charmingly terrible little puppet, and the movie's not great, but it is really enjoyable, and it deserves a little space in history for setting the bar for self-aware borderline horror parodies, and, and you should watch it for that reason alone. So when most people think of Japanese horror, they think of movies like The Ring and The Grudge, spooky ghost stories that lean towards sheer terror. What they're not thinking of is 1999's Wild Zero. Now, I could probably do this whole list with great obscure foreign horror, but maybe I'll do one of those at some other point, but this is my only non-English language pick this go around, and it's positively insane fun. How do I even explain this one? Ugh. Uh, I'll, I'll try. Okay, there's this Japanese punk band called Guitar Wolf, and they have a diehard fan named Ace, who meets his dream girl in Tobio. However, he also finds himself smack dab in the middle of a zombie attack, and an assortment of wacky characters all have random encounters interspliced with performances from Guitar Wolf. Tobio has some secrets of her own, and Ace uses a magic whistle to summon the wolf. And did I mention the UFOs? There's UFOs. Oh, and electric throwing star guitar picks, all leading up to a big finale where everything is just nuts. If you don't really like over-the-top movies, this one probably won't be for you because it kind of feels like Japanese trauma in a way, but if that's your thing, then I guarantee some maximum rock and roll with this one. I guess it also helps to enjoy Guitar Wolf's music as well since it features a few performances by them, and if that doesn't convince you, maybe this shot will. Okay, so Soul Keeper came out back in 2001 and apparently premiered on the Sci-Fi Network back when that didn't automatically equal garbage. But, but I mean, it, it still kind of meant that. I discovered this movie at a blockbuster as a friend and I were on the hunt for a terrible movie to watch. Look at this box art and tell me this doesn't look terrible. It was holographic as well, and that, that usually meant straight poop, and then the back of the box sealed it. We thought this was going to be just terribly fun. Turns out that we were wrong since this movie is fun as hell, and fairly decent. It follows these thieves, Corey and Terrence, who get roped into a supernatural journey by Charles Lee Ray here, Brad Dourif himself. Their adventures take them to Tiny Zeus Lister, Deborah Gibson, and Robert Davi. The writing has some actual sharpness at times. Do you guys know any Lawrence Welk? I piss on Lawrence Welk. But the actual storyline is kind of a mess. 
I'm not going to try and convince you that this is actually a good movie, just one that's way more fun than it should be. It's probably a bad idea to recommend this to you as something that's good and worth watching since part of the reason I love this movie is that I went into it expecting pure trash and was just so pleasantly surprised with it. So our boys are trying to stop this sorcerer called the Magus from being reborn into a new body. And there's Night of the Living Dead parodies and Faceless Girls and Karen Black. And they head into a final battle, but can they stop the Magus and this big demon which is a pretty cool practical effect? But a pretty bad digital one as well? The ending of this one actually surprised me a bit and you know what? I, I dig it. Is it a good movie? Nope. But if you like your cheese and fun, you'll like it, so check it out. So you'd think that this one would be a candidate for horror timelines because it's Dude Bro Party Massacre Part 3, but there actually is no Parts 1 and 2. It's a horror comedy with the emphasis on the comedy, and it's from 5 Second Films, which if you haven't heard of them is a really popular YouTube channel where each of their films were only 5 seconds long. It's extremely funny. This was their full length feature debut. And it's a parody of Friday the 13th type films, and supposedly a lost film from the 80s. See, there was two previous massacres that included Larry King for some reason, and a burned villain named Motherface. Now, I should point out that recommending comedies is hard because humor is really subjective, but I love this one. It features John Francis Daly and Mark Sestero. Oh, hi, Mark. Nina Hartley, Patton Oswald, Andrew W.K., and a bunch of college frat guys go to a lake house for the weekend to have a big dude bro party so you know that there'll be a massacre. Well, there is, and there's some pretty good practical effects. I mean, I'm serious in that this is a really specific sense of humor. You've ruined my life! I hate my little hairy baby dog dick! But it's the right amount of ridiculous and randomness. Name us. No, turtleneck, turtleneck bro, flannel bro, lucky guess. But there's enough horror stuff in here for you to just enjoy. Plus, if you're an Olivia Taylor Dudley, Dudley Taylor fan, you'll probably be pretty pleased. I'm warning you right now though, the ending of this one gets, it's pretty weird. So I guess just, just be ready for that. So if you lived in the UK in the early 90s, you may have caught a little documentary on Halloween night in 1992 called Ghost Watch. If you didn't, that was your only chance for a while since the controversy around it caused the BBC to never re-air it. And it wasn't released on home video until 10 years later in 2002. So what made this little film such a big deal? Well, apparently people didn't learn anything from the whole Orson Welles War of the Worlds radio show debacle, and people actually thought that this was real. I mean, it was presented as a dramatic show, and if you were a Red Dwarf fan, saying Craig Charles as a news presenter, even if he was playing himself, should have felt off, but the film is a fake documentary about a haunted house adapting a real life story. The same story, by the way, that The Conjuring 2 is based on. So if you find yourself watching this and it all seems a bit familiar, that's why. It's a TV special with a crew going in live to investigate the family being haunted by a ghost. And when the mother told the daughters that the sounds were just coming from the pipes, the girls began to call the ghost pipes. And that's one of the most genius bits of this one. Like The Haunting of Hill House, if you watch closely in the background, pipes appears about a dozen times. When things start getting really supernatural, people started to freak out and the BBC reportedly received up to 30,000 phone calls from people that either thought the show was real and they were actually seeing proof of the spirit world live on screen, or they just called to complain that the special was too terrifying for television. Any way you slice it with this one, it's a great story and it's executed perfectly. It, it feels a little dated now, and if you watch The Conjuring 2, you kinda know what twist that they're gonna throw your way, but it's done to perfection, so go watch it now before they decide to ban it again. Okay, so there's this filmmaker out there named Jake West, and he's mostly done documentary stuff on horror, but he's done a couple of features, and unfortunately, two of them are Pumpkinhead Ashes to Ashes, which was just terrible, and Razorblade Smile, a really try-hard mess of a movie that got a lot of buzz back in the day. But sorry, it's also terrible. However, Jake also bought us Evil Aliens, a silly fun little splatterfest, and this film, Doghouse. From 2009, it features Danny Dyer, Mickey Smith, 
Stephen Graham, and a few other guys all heading out to a town in the middle of nowhere for a weekend to help a friend get over a divorce. Problem is, as soon as they get into the town, it's empty. Until it's not. You see, there's zombies here. But not just regular zombies, as whatever this outbreak is, it's only affected the women in the town. And that's the fun of this movie. At its core, it's basically a battle of the sexes, with the male characters basically representing the archetypes of guy cliches, while each of the zombies are just representations of female stereotypes, like the bride, the hairstylist, crossing guard, old granny, schoolgirl, housewife, and more. They even fight with traditional male-related instruments like golf clubs and remote control cars. It's like every gender stereotype against another, and it's, it's fun as hell. These aren't your typical zombies though, they're government experiments that mutate like they were in demons. And everything leads to a final face-off, and it, it, it's not a perfect movie, but I guarantee you'll enjoy it. I hesitate to call this one a little bit of a deeper movie, because it is a fairly surface level zombie film, but I do think that there was some time and effort put into the symbolism, and probably a little bit more of a message than you would expect from this type of a movie. 2015's Savage Land is as timely a movie as you can get, and it's surprising. It's an exercise in creeping you out as much as possible with as little influencing as possible. This is in a format that I apparently love, the fake documentary. This subgenre is kind of like found footage, but I found it works really well with horror films in general. You see, they convince you that you're watching a real documentary or television show about true events featuring interviews with people who were there, or commenting on the horrors, and you often feel like you're watching reality, even more so than with found footage, since you really don't have to come up with reasons for people to keep filming during nightmare scenarios. This one is about a town on the border of Mexico, with a portion of the population being illegal immigrants, and one night of terror in which everyone in the town is killed. The only survivor, Francisco Salazar, is blamed, and hey look, that's Dan Trabulus. He's in my movie, The Complex, and he's awesome. When Francisco's camera is discovered much later, the film is developed and tells the true story of what happened that night, and that's where this one excels. The only things that we get to see of that night are still photos, and they're black and white, and they're simply haunting. I'm a big fan of what you don't see in a movie, and these photos leave a lot for your mind to fill in the blanks, and my mind filled in plenty. So ultimately calling the town Heinzman tips off that this is a zombie film, and Francisco makes his way around the town, taking pictures of the attack, each one getting creepier and creepier. If you're looking for jump scares and gore, you're not going to find any of that here. You're only going to get some motionless images, but trust me, it's enough. The climax of this one, again, mostly told to us and not really shown, and I'm, and I'm thankful for it because I'm pretty sure I couldn't handle actually seeing it. This one has three credited directors, and none of them have directed something since, but I'm, but I'm looking forward to seeing more from any of them. Big recommendation from me on this one. Okay, a few years back, I guess back in 2009 when it came out, I ran across a movie called Triangle on Netflix, and I watched it. I knew nothing about it. I didn't read the synopsis, but I wanted to watch something, and it looked interesting, and holy crap was it. All that I intend to say about this one that it's about a group of friends that go on a boat ride and come across a huge cruise liner. They board the boat only to find no one on it but a mysterious stalker. And that's all you get. That's all you need. Just, just let the weirdness unfold after that. It's full of atmosphere, genuine drama, and will leave you scratching your head when it's all said and done. It features the remake Kathy Lutz and Thor's little brother and was directed by Christopher Smith who also gave us the pretty cool creep and severance and Severance could easily have been on this list as well. I'm not sure that I would qualify this one as a straightforward horror movie, although it starts out that way, and again, without giving anything away, it certainly doesn't end up that way. Check it out. Back in 1999, there was this little movie called The Blair Witch Project. You may have heard of that one. One of the directors, Eduardo Sanchez, has since gone on to direct quite a few other things, and I have to tell you, at least three of them belong on this list. Altered is awesome, Seventh Moon is great, but I'm going to go with 2011's Lovely Molly. It tells the story of two newlyweds, Tim and Molly, who's lovely, it's in the title. They move into Molly's parents' old house in the country to start their lives over, and of course, spooky stuff happens. It's a cliche setup, with all the makings of the run-of-the-mill straight-to-video clunker, 
but Sanchez proves what he's already proven a few times over now, and that's his ability to create a fantastically creepy atmosphere and mood. This is a relatively quiet movie, light on jump scares, and heavy on the psychological aspect. You're never really sure if Molly's going crazy or if there's something more happening, but it's pretty clear that something's in the house and it's going to go overboard, and you're along for the ride the whole time. There's plenty of blurring the line of reality and fantasy as we discover Molly has past issues with her dead dad and the film plays up the mental terror of abuse and trauma. And it's hard to watch at times as things become a blur of sex, drugs, and psychosis. And it succeeds by disturbing you with things that couldn't happen in the real world alongside things that happen every day, unfortunately. It barrels headlong into an ending that you might see coming until it gets to that one haunting shot. Watch this one. In fact, watch all of Sanchez's movies. Okay, here it is, my number one most recommended obscure horror film. This one, um, some people have heard of, but most horror fans I talk to have not heard of this one or have not seen it. But you should check it out. It's Lake Mungo. I went into this one also completely blind, and it was one of the most surprisingly fulfilling movies that I watched that entire year. This is another one that's a tough one to talk about because like Triangle, I feel like the impact of it is taken away when you know details about it. So I'm keeping this as spoiler free as I can. The film is about a family whose daughter dies in a tragic accident while they're camping at the titular lake and the mysterious things that happen at their house afterwards. The film is told in a faux documentary style, much like Savage Land, and even though it's not an overwhelmingly scary film, it's definitely chock full of atmosphere. It's creepy, quiet, and the definition of a slow burn, although even though it's slow, it's definitely never boring. There's one single scene in the film that's just straight up disturbing, but again, don't come into this one expecting to be scared, although you'll definitely leave it feeling saddened. It's more about dealing with loss than dealing with terror, and I can't recommend it enough. If you haven't seen it, I urge you to seek it out. It's a great little flick, and make sure to stick around through the credits. So there you have it. It's 10 movies. I hope that after you watch this, you're not mad at me saying, like, those aren't obscure. I've heard of all of those, and I've seen them 10 times, because... Uh, these are ones that I know I've talked to with a lot of people, and uh, quite a few have not seen them, so that was kind of taken, taken aback. Um, some of these are a little bit more popularized, a lot of these are a little more well-known, but not, not, not really. These are films that are off of the radar, but I hope you enjoy them, I hope you enjoyed this list. Um, let me know what you thought of these movies. If you do go out and watch them after watching this video, let me know what you thought of them down below. Feel free to just, like, make fun of me for liking them in the first place because some of them some of them I, I will admit are not great I just love them um, and I think you will too check them out um, check out the rest of my videos uh, do the whole liking and subscribe thing down below um, check out my patreon page these guys are my patrons and they help support this channel and you can too as well um, you could also check out the new horror timelines t-shirts and merch that's in the merch store and all that good stuff and I will see you in a little while for another great video thanks guys bye bye